God, I praise you, God. And we call all of it done in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 So for those of you, this is your first time here. Uh, this whole year, we have been focusing on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Um, and the last couple of weeks, there was a video kind of circulating on um, social media. And the part I saw was like a clip of a larger conversation. And in that clip, there were two people talking. And one of the, peop one of the persons were trying to convey to the other person that their behavior and how they move and shake in life probably was maladaptive and that they probably should pick um, some different tools in order to how they're functioning. Now, uh, nobody likes to be told they're raggedy to their face, right? So the other person was super defensive um, and deflecting, and they were like, well, you know, I do those things, but I'm doing well, I'm succeeding. In fact, it's my superpower, right? That's what the person said. And I was watching it, and I was this close to judging. I was right, right there. And then God said to me, go ahead and get that log out of your eye right, as you're trying to look at the speck in their eye, because the reality is I needed the reminder in that moment, there is nothing super about my power. There's nothing, right, for as smart as I think I am or eloquent or whatever, right, my own power has a limit. It has a cap to it. But we have been learning over the last, what, eight, nine months that we have access to the greatest power, right, and that is the power of the Holy Spirit, yeah, yeah, amen. So as we continue in that, we're starting a new kind of sub-series, if you will, and it's about the joy of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I am so glad there are people who are joyous, yes, about the Holy Spirit. So today's teaching is abiding in joy. Now, uh, church has a way of like using language and words and we don't always explain what all the words mean, but like you know when to raise your hand and you know when to say amen, but there are times when we're probably not agreeing on the same word. So before we start, I wanna make sure that we have some shared understanding of some language, okay? The first is let's have an understanding of what it means to abide. Abide means to dwell, to remain, to be present, to be held, and to be kept, okay? Abiding is much more than just hanging around somebody, right? Ab abiding is more than proximity, right? I'm glad you all are here today. Praise God for that. But this is not abiding, right? This is gathering, again, beneficial, but abiding is more about connection and not about proximity, the next definition I want to make sure that we all have an understanding of is the biblical definition of joy, okay? The biblical definition of joy is a feeling of good pleasure and happiness that is dependent on who Jesus is rather than who we are or what's happening around us. I think sometimes we can confuse happiness and joy because at times they can look the same way, right? But happiness is contingent upon what's happening, right? So, you know, I can be happy at the event. I can be happy, you know, at the football game. I can be happy around a certain person. But when the event is over, when the person leaves, when my team loses, Pastor Howard, because, you know, I'm a Raider fan, so it happens a lot, right? Then my happiness, right, my happiness goes right? But joy is sustaining. It's everlasting. Why? Because again, it's not about what's, go what's going on. You know, we're going to talk about it in a moment, but like, you know, we say things like, oh, you should be joyful in all things, but that should not suggest that all things cause you to rejoice, right? I'm not joyful that I lost my job or joyful that there was the illness. The joy comes from knowing that Jesus Christ is with me in that, right? And what we're going to find out today is that joy, it is a promise to us and that it's full. It's abundant. It's always there, okay? And then the last definition I want to make sure that we understand is fruit, 
okay? So fruit is the result or the evidence of what has been planted, okay? So if we look at Galatians 5, and 23, it talks about the fruit, singular, of the Spirit. What is that? It's the result of his presence within us. Now, I saw this actually recently. You'll, you'll often hear folks talk about the fruits of the Spirit. There's only one fruit, and the fruit is love. Okay, that's the fruit. Now, when you look at Galatians, you're going to see a comma after love, and it's going to have a list of things afterwards. That's not different fruit, right? That is a characteristic of the original fruit, what is love, right? So it reads, the fruit of the Spirit, which is the result of his presence within us, is love, which is unselfish concern for others. Then the characteristics of love is joy, inner peace, patience, patience, right? And I like how the Amplified says, patience is not just waiting, it's how you act when you're waiting, right? Ooh, goodness. Um, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, okay? So those are all the components of the fruit, singular, of the Spirit, okay? So with that understanding, let's go to the Word of God, and we're going to start at John chapter 15, uh, verses 1 through 11. We're going to break these up in like three chunks, and I'm reading from the Amplified, and it reads, I am the true vine, say true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, say take away, and every branch that continues to bear fruit, he repeatedly prunes so that it will bear more fruit, even richer and finer fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have given you, the teachings which I have discussed with you. So remain or abide in me, and I will abide in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit by itself without remaining to the vine, neither can you bear fruit, producing evidence of your faith, unless you remain in me. So I want to give you just a little bit of context about that. Um, you don't have to turn there, but, if you, but, in your, but when you can, look at Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. And there, the prophet Isaiah, he's giving um, an illustration. He's telling a story. And the story that the prophet Isaiah is telling, that there was a gardener who wanted to plant a vineyard. And he uh, had expectations that the vineyard was going to produce great, wonderful grapes. Okay? But in fact... The grapes that were produced, the Bible says, were wild grapes. Some say sour grapes, right? So it was a bad crop, is the point. And Isaiah gives that illustration and compares it to how God saw Israel. God's desire for Israel was that Israel would be good ground for people, people of Judah to produce. But instead... And we're going to find out why in a minute here. But instead, they did not produce good fruit. That is why in John 15, it makes the distinction. Jesus makes the distinction of the true vine, right? He wants to make it very clear that we're not to abide in Israel, but we are to abide in Jesus, right? And the reason for that is we know that, and we saw this, you know, months ago in our teaching, that the folks of Israel, they were relying solely on the law. And what we know is that the law by itself cannot produce good fruit, okay? So that is why it's so important that we recognize here that he is talking about the true vine, okay? Now listen, we know tons, we can see it all around us. There are folks who are rooted to something, right? And they're producing something, right? But it's not good fruit, right? So regardless of what we say, regardless of what labels we want to place on ourselves, the world is going to know who we are connected to by our fruit, okay? Our fruit's always going to tell on us. 
And here's the thing. Israel had proximity to God. They knew God, right? But they were not abiding. They were abide, abiding in the laws, okay? So, and you're, you're, you're going to hear a running theme throughout today's teaching is that uh, the branch takes on the characteristic of the vine, right? The fruit is going to look like whatever tree is coming from, okay? So now, the other thing I want you to look at, in verse 2, it says, he takes away. Now, I always thought that meant that if there were branches that were not producing fruit, right, they just got tossed to the side, right? We picked them up, we threw them away, right? But what I realized is, y'all, I have become an expert on everything vineyards, okay? I know all kind of stuff now about the growing of vineyards. So I want you to keep in mind that another translation for take away is in the Greek, it's lift up, okay? Keep that in mind. So here's what I learned about, vin- about grapevines. Grapevines, when they're growing and when they're healthy, there's going to be vines that get really heavy and drag on the ground. And the reason why that's a problem is because if the vines are on the ground, the ones that are above it are blocking out the sun. And grapevines don't do well in the shadows. Okay? But the other thing is that when a grapevine is on the floor, on the ground, it, um, insects can get it, right? Mold, fungus. And ultimately, that vine isn't going to produce fruit. But because the gardener wants the grapevines to produce fruit, they lift up those vines, right? And usually they put it on like a trellis. That way, those vines get sun. Those vines are away from insects. And then you don't have like rot and mold and all that type of stuff. Y'all, God wants us to produce good fruit. He does. But he's mindful of the fact that there's going to be times when in life we are dragging on the ground, right? We're caught in the shadows, right? We're at the point of being um, um, devoured, right? We're at the point of rotting. And God knows that if he left us there, we're not going to produce fruit, right? We need access. So just like the grapevines need access to the sun, S-U-N, We need access to the sun, S-O-N, right? So then we can read that verse differently. We can now read it as says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts up, right? And now, so how does God lift us up? How does he encourage us? How does he get us to a place back to where we're producing fruit? That's through his word. That's through his word, right? Because think about it. When you are in that shadow place, when you are low, right, then what happens? Despair comes in. Frustration comes in, right? And if we're not careful, that frustration will choke out the love that's growing in us. And that's what God wants to produce. So this was helpful for me because I'm going to say, I don't know that when I'm frustrated or sad or depressed, my first inclination is run to the word. But that's what the word does, right? It encourages us. It builds us up, right? That is how God, who's the gardener in all of this, lifts us up. There's something else that is said in verse 2, and it talks about that pruning, okay? So years ago, uh, the house I was renting had um, a rose bush, or a couple rose bushes in the front yard. My rent included a gardener, and he would come and he would cut back the rose bushes a little bit because where the rose bushes were, uh, if they they got overgrown, you weren't gonna be able to come to the front door, right? So he would cut them back so that you could get to the door. I thought that was pruning, right? And it kind of was. So anyways, my dad came to visit me once, and we're doing stuff in the yard, and he's like, you need to prune this rose bush. Now, here's the thing. The rose bush looked good to me because it was big, and it was full, lots of leaves, lots of leaves, a little bit of flower, a little bit of flowers, right? And he was like, no, you need to cut this all back. I'm like, okay, sure. So he's like, you know what? I'll do it. You go do whatever. So I go and do whatever. I come back out. 
and he cut that bush down to almost nothing, nothing. I'm like, my landlord is gonna, this, is, this ain't my house, this is their house, right? And what he told me was, you have to get rid of all those leaves. You gotta get rid of all those like intertwined branches because why? It's gonna stop the plant from producing flowers. Here's the thing, the plant looked healthy. The plant looked like it was producing. If you drove by, you wouldn't say anything about that bush, but the reality was it wasn't producing the fruit, flowers in that case, that it needed until it was pruned all the way back, right? <sighs> Can I give you another example about pruning? This is a personal testimony, thank you very much. So a couple weeks ago, I was, um, I am, uh, I'm helping, I'm planning this event and this project or whatever. So I'm emailing with someone. I don't really know this person very well. Um, I've had some interaction with them. So, you know, I'm emailing. Thank God it was email, by the way. Just <laughs> um, and so they respond. So we're going back and forth. And at one point, this person responded back to me. And I said, I was at my desk, and I said, I know he crazy. Well, actually, I'm in church, so I shouldn't lie. That's not what I said, but that's the clean version for all of y'all. He was talking to me cash crazy. I mean crazy. And I'm like, listen, y'all, I try my best. I do. I do. I tried to, like, have some self-control and some, have some kindness. But I'm like, oh, he is crazy. So I had my good cussing out already typed. I was ready, and it was going to be good. It was going to be really good. So I'm doing all this, but because Holy Spirit is repeatedly pruning, he checked me so quick, and y'all, I hit delete. Delete, 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 delete. I deleted the whole thing and responded with like, okay, right, or whatever it is. <laughs> and... And when I was done, I, I talked to a friend of mine who knew all the players involved, and I said to her, and I know this is the Holy Spirit because this don't even sound like me. I'm like, you know what? I wanted to cuss him out because he deserved it, okay? But Holy Spirit said, do not say that because it's going to damage your witness, Again, again, the fruit that comes out of us demonstrates, right, our faith. It demonstrates what we believe. I'm supposed to be, I'm tied to the true vine, right? I'm supposed to look like that. Y'all, the person I was emailing with lives in Sacramento, right? How would that look if I'm up here? He's not here, so I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> But what would that look like? I cuss you out on Tuesday, and then you come to church and see me preach. That's wild. That's wild. And here's the thing. Understand the repeated pruning, right? What did God cut away from me? The need to be right all the time. He cut it away, right? What did he cut away? The need to have the last word. Oh, oh he cut it away. But listen, there's a repeated pruning because my self-righteousness is going to grow back. It's going to grow back. And again, my self-righteousness, my ego is going to choke out the kindness in me, right? It's going to choke out the love that God wants to produce in me, right? Keep in mind, when we're talking about fruit, almost all fruit have seeds, which means the point of fruit is to reproduce. That's why we have it, right? And that fruit in me cannot reproduce if the weeds of ego, if the weeds of self-righteousness are choking it out. I found a powerful quote when I was preparing, and it says, the power of his truth uproots misconceptions and confusion as we hide God's word in our heart. He prunes away wayward or distracted thoughts and prepare the soil of our hearts and lives and lives to produce good fruit. God is gonna prune away, y'all, that critical spirit. He's gonna prune away all that doubting. It's gonna grow back, which is why there's that repeated pruning, 
right? He's going to prune away all those worries and all those thoughts and all those things that are going to um, stop the fruit, right, from growing and producing. Amen? All right. Let's keep going here. Uh, Looking at verse (laughs) 5. It says, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me, that is, cut off from the vital union with me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown out like a broken off branch and withers and dies. And they gather such branches and throw them into fire and they are burned. If you remain or abide in me and my word abides in you, that is, if we are vitally united and my message lives in your heart, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. So in this here, we need to be mindful of the fact that we can do nothing unless we are connected to the true vine, right? Going back to the um, analogy of the rose bushes, I like to have fresh flowers in my house, right? And so when I had the rose bush, I would cut roses and put them in a vase and put them in the house. And for as beautiful as those bouquets were, the moment I cut the flower off, the death process in that flower was starting, right? Because it can't survive unless it's connected to the branch or to the vine. Now, again, we do all these tricks to make our bouquets last longer, right? We put a little sugar in the water, put a coin in the water, put a little powder, whatever. And that's wonderful, but that just is delaying the inevitable. Removed from the bush, it's going to die. The same is true for us. When we are disconnected, right? When we are disconnected from the true vine, we can do all kinds of tricks to sustain, right? We think we're doing it by ourselves, but eventually, right, there is death. I can't do anything unless I am connected uh, to that vine. And it's interesting because Jesus is talking to the disciples at a really crucial time. Uh, He had already told the disciples that he was leaving, right? That he was planning, he he was going to ascend to heaven. And he knew that the disciples were going to be worried about that, right? Sad about that, scared about that. But then he said that when he would depart, he wasn't going to leave them by ourselves. He wasn't going to leave us by ourselves, right? Instead, he was going to send the Holy Spirit, The work of the Holy Spirit is to keep us connected to Jesus. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. So when we are abiding in Christ, we get the promise and the benefits of the Holy Spirit. Another thing that I see in this verse, and I think it's important for us to know, it says that when we are abiding in him and he is abiding in us, That's important to know, y'all. This is a mutual relationship. It's mutual. Have um, you ever hugged somebody and they didn't hug you back? Isn't it weird? It's so weird, right? You're all tightly embraced and they're just sitting there like this here. And I think sometimes we think that's what God is doing to us, right? We think that we have to chase after God. He's not running from us. He's not running right? He is embracing us. He's abiding in us as we abide in him. And it's important now, I want to be clear, while the relationship, the abiding is mutual, we are the ones who are dependent, right? We are dependent on him. But again, it is mutual. And so we see through that, that Christ is not only with us, that proximity, but he's also in us, right? The the ministry of Jesus Christ on the earth, Uh, The name Emmanuel means God is with us. And it emphasizes that when Jesus came to earth to be among the people, he did so um, to, to demonstrate that he was physically near us. He is right there with us. But then the gift of the Holy Spirit reminds us that he is not only with us, but he's in us. Right? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit after the resurrection and his ascension Christ sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within every believer. And this means that the Spirit of God empowers and guides believers, leading us to live according to God's will. 
That is the whole job of the Holy Spirit, to help us live according to God's will. And how does he do that, right? It always, it, it, it probably shouldn't, but it amazes me, right, that God, that, that, that Holy Spirit shows up in our situations tailored to what we need in that situation, right? So for some of us, Holy Spirit is showing up right now as a comforter, right? For others of us, he's showing up as an advocate, right? We're going to see in a minute here that he is our intercessor, right? He prays for us. Some, we're also, some of us know that he is a counselor, right? He answers those questions that we have, right? He's our strength. He stands by us. And the Holy Spirit, he will teach us all things, and he will help us to remember everything that the Father has told us. We have to understand that we can do nothing, nothing without the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Bishop has been telling us for months now, everything that God wants to do in the earth, he's doing it through the Holy Spirit. Everything God wants to do for you in the earth, he's doing it through the Holy Spirit, right? Our healing, our redemption, right? All of that is from the Holy Spirit. And then, so again, we have to keep in mind that we take on the characteristics of that who we are abiding in, and we are abiding in the true vine. So a branch depends on the true vine for everything. So when this scripture talks about because we are abiding and because he's abiding in us, everything we ask, right, he will do. Now, sometimes I think, you know, and we're not ignorant to this, we all see how that scripture can be uh, warped a little bit. And people think it means, okay, I can just ask for any old thing or whatever. No, no, no. I'm abiding in Christ. He is abiding in me, right? And then the Holy Spirit is interceding, meaning he's praying for me on my behalf. Okay, look it. The Holy Spirit only does and says what the Father already has planned for us. Okay, follow me. So if the Holy Spirit is only saying and doing what the Father already planned for us. He already knows that. I don't know that. You don't know that. The Holy Spirit knows that. So then the Holy Spirit takes that knowledge. Holy Spirit knows what the Father has for you. He takes that knowledge and then intercedes for that on your behalf. That's what we have access to. I can't do that in my own. Right? Romans 8, 26 says, in the same way, the Spirit comes to help us in our weakness because we do not know what prayer to offer or even how to offer it as we should. But the Spirit himself knows our need and at the right time intercedes on our behalf with sighs and groaning too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because the Spirit intercedes before God on our behalf, God's people, in accordance with God's will. The Holy Spirit shares the will and the plan of the Father, right? That's his job. And so when I understand that, then I can look at the scripture that says, I have the mind of Christ, right? I can look at that differently. It's not like I'm a God. I'm not, right? But I am connected to that which who knows the mind of Christ, he is abiding in me. That is why I can have the mind of Christ, right? That gives a, us a, I think, a more accurate understanding of Psalms 37, 4, that says he will give us the desires of our heart. He gives us what to desire for, and then he gives us the desires of our heart. Y'all, we don't have to pray any misses now right? We don't have to do that. This word, that's not me saying that. The word says that there are no more misses, right? That when we pray according to his will, right? And we know his will because the Holy Spirit is interceding on our behalf, then our prayers are answered. Amen? Okay, let's wrap this up. Let's look at verse um, eight. 
My God is glorified and honored by this. When you bear much fruit and prove yourself to be my true disciples, I have loved you just as the Father has loved me. Remain in me and do not doubt my love for you. Because if you keep my commandments and obey my teachings, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remained in his love. I have told you, verse 11, I have told you these things so that my joy and delight may be in you and that your joy may be made full, complete, and overflowing. God is honored by our good fruit. He's honored by that, right? Uh, yes, the good fruit is for us, right? The good fruit is for us to share with others, obviously, but also it's for the glory of God. And again, it's very interesting to me. Jesus here is telling the disciples about the joy that Jesus received from the Father. Y'all, the timing of this, Jesus knew that the cross was ahead of him. So even Jesus, in his trials, right, still had the joy of the Father as he was getting ready to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, as he was getting ready to go to Calvary's cross. How powerful and unique is God's joy that it still remained in Christ even in the time of such great trial and testing, right? And his desire and provision for all of us is that his joy, which is so different from that of the world, should be our joy, right? It says that his joy might be made complete in all of us. Jesus has the joy um, of the Father, and we are connected to Jesus, which means we have the joy of the Father, right? Again, I started off by saying when we say that, that is not to suggest that, we ha that the trials bring rejoicing, right? That would be silly, y'all. No one is suggesting that you should rejoice in the face of, you know, whatever health concern or losing your job. But the joy comes that in that we know that Jesus is right there with us. Now, here's the thing. I will be honest with you. I don't always recognize Jesus at work in the trials I'm going through, right? I can get very caught up in the actual trial. What am I going to do? How is this or whatever? But y'all, we learned a couple of weeks ago that the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus Christ to us, right? So when we are in the trial and we cannot see Jesus, he's there, he's there. The Holy Spirit reveals him to us, right? So then I can have joy because I know I'm not going through this test by myself, right? I know that I am connected to the great healer. I know that I'm connected to the great comforter, right? That is where the joy comes. And again, regardless of the situation, that joy, it doesn't leave, right? It's not fleeting. It is always there. So again, I want to go back to verse 11. I have told you these things so that my joy and delight may be in you and that your joy may be made full and complete and overflowing. When we, y'all, we receive the fullness of joy when we are in God's presence, right? That's what the word of God says, that in his presence is fullness of joy, right? And so we have access to that full, we have access to a full reservoir of joy that we can always tap into, always. And here's the thing, it says joy full and complete. I want you to think of a glass or, you know, a pail or a container. If that container is full of joy, nothing else can fit in there, right? When we have that fullness of joy, doubt can't fit in there because it's already full of joy. When we have the fullness of joy, right, worry and all of that, it can't even fit inside of it, right? Um, and, another, and so we want to make sure um, that we are mindful of the fact that, our, that the joy of the Lord, it is sustaining and it's always with us. I, um, I, I, like, um, I like words, right? I always tell folks, like, words mean things. Because folks just be using words 
all kind of willy-nilly, right? You're just putting stuff in weird places. But like words actually have meaning, right? And so I always pay very close attention to the words that we see in Scripture. So when I look at uh, Psalms 1611, it says that weeping may, but joy will. Weeping may, but joy will. Listen, life, we all say, you're saying life be life and right? And so whatever happens, but the weeping isn't the promise. The joy is the promise. And sometimes I think we get too caught up on the weeping And that isn't even promised to us. It might happen. It might be happening now. I get it. But the promise that we have, y'all, is that joy will come. Amen. 